And I am Susie Spickle, and welcome to Ask a Naturalist, the Harris Center's seasonal Stump a Naturalist game show that we like to play. Today is a special edition, the Groundhog Edition, and it's so exciting to have so many great Harris Center um, naturalists and staff members here tonight. We'll just go around and do some introducing. Uh, Miles, why don't you start and maybe go over some of our rules, too? Yeah, sure thing. Hello, everybody. I'm Miles. I'm the operations manager at the Harris Center. And, and Susie, since it's not in the presentation, how much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? <laughs> Uh, Miles, I have some sad news for you, but woodchucks don't chuck wood. They leave that to the beavers. So no, hey, thanks, Miles. How about Phil Brown? Why don't you tell us who you are and what you're up to? Sure. Hello, everybody. I'm Phil Brown. I'm the bird conservation director, and I also do some land work at the Harris Center. Um, yeah, busy winter of programming, um, getting outside as much as possible with folks and um, trying to get people excited about nature. Um, so yeah, well, uh, I'll handle some of the bird questions this evening. Thanks, Phil. And is it true? Is that your mom? Is she zooming in too? Is that Fran? Hi. Hi <laughs> <laughs> so cute. I love it. All right, Jenna, how about you? What, who are you and what are you going to be looking forward to answering? Hi everyone. I'm Jenna and I'm one of the teacher naturalists at the Harris Center. And my background is in entomology. So I usually answer any insect related questions. So this is actually might be my first groundhog edition Ask a Naturalist because in the winter months, I am often not need it, but here I am because there's some insect questions tonight. Strange, everybody buckle up. It's gonna be an exciting Ask a Naturalist with insect questions appearing in February. All right, Jeremy, how about you? Who are you and what questions will you be looking forward to answering? Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Wilson. I'm the director here at the Hare Center. My background is in forest ecology and, and management. And so I tend to answer some of the questions about trees. Although Great. Karen Seaver often helps me Yay. with the difficult ones. Actually, let's go to Karen next. Hey everybody, uh, I'm Karen Seaver. I'm an ecologist at the Harris Center and I like to attend to plant matters. Um, but I also love okay. animals and microbes too. So, so nice to see you all here tonight. Looking forward to this evening. Love it. Thanks, Karen. And last but not least, we have Margaret Baker zooming in. And Margaret, tell us what you do. You do something really special for our Ask a Naturalist oh, program. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Margaret Baker. And I get to um, format... Um, slash design the slides that you're going to see. So I take your photos. Thank you for sending them in and your great, simple, short and sweet questions and great comments. And I make them all look uh, like they're super readable and um, consistent and put photo credits in for images. And just uh, it's one of my favorite things to do is just make those slides sing. So um, happy to be here and um see what we can learn thanks oh, thanks margaret and miles can you i know this is a surprise but can you unmute audrey because audrey's here tonight i just oh, took a scroll through and we're really excited we have a new harris center person mm -hmm. and audrey can you introduce yourself mm -hmm. tell us who you are and what you do for the harris center Hello, I am Audrey and I just started working at the Harris Center. I'm super excited. I am the new communications manager and I just moved here to the area from North Carolina. So I'm excited to learn about some stuff tonight. Yay, welcome to New Hampshire. It's going to be really cold. <laughs> Hope you have some woolies. All right, um, I'm Susie Spickle and I am the community programs director for the Harris Center. And the questions I love to answer are the ones about mammals, um, but really any kind of animal question, I'll take a stab out. I might be wrong for some of them. Without further ado, why don't we start our uh, panel of Ask a Naturalist on you. This is a poll, um, so we're going to give you a question, and you will be able to vote your answer. And the question is, how long can a groundhog hibernate? That's looking pretty good. Miles, can you see the results? Yeah, sure enough. Uh, five months of hibernation is a top choice here at 48% 40, of our, our participants. Um, 
voting for on that one. And then it goes down to one month. Nobody thought they were Van Winkles. I wish they were. I like that. Van Winkles for the groundhog. Something that I love to think about when I think about groundhogs is they have to put on a lot of extra weight when they're going to um, go to sleep for so long, five months of their time. They have to eat a lot before then. And something I recently read, because I just wrote an article about groundhogs, is that they eat up to um, more than a pound of vegetation at one sitting. So that would be similar to a 150 pound person if they sat down and ate a 15 pound steak. Oh, think about that tonight when you eat your dinner. All right. That's all we've got for the poll. But here's our first question. Lady beetles infest my house in the winter, gathering in the west side of the house around the windows. What are they doing and are they native? So Jenna, I'm pretty sure that this is a question that falls into your area of expertise. What can you tell us? Well, so a lot of folks um, ask about this because lady beetles are really particular about which houses they go into, which... Um, for a long time, people did not know why they're choosing my house over Susie's house or my house over Miles's house. And it really turns out to be related to where the first lady beetles um, in your neighborhood decide to go. They have pheromones that will, it's like a grouping pheromone. So it's an aggregation pheromone. And in the winter time, in the fall, they're trying to find somewhere warm to spend the winter. Um, back before there were houses around, they were finding places like inside hollow trees or inside rotten logs or down under the snow, a place where the snow would be covering them up to insulate them. But now that we have these nice cozy houses around, they're going to go inside our homes and live um, often in our walls or in, it's really funny at my house, they, um, I don't know where they are. And then in the spring, they just start to come out and we still, we've gotten up to like 53 last spring. Um, so, but they are choosing houses generally where the first few go in and start to emit this aggregation pheromone. They like to aggregate together. Um, so sometimes it's just luck of the draw. Are they native? Most likely no. So um, we have most of our native lady beetles have been sort of displaced. Well, I guess not displaced is the best word. It's the word I'm looking for. Um, outcompeted by this Asian lady beetle that is orange and black. So the one on the in the photograph here, while it is a lovely photo, this is this one is a native lady beetle. Um, typically, the Asian lady beetles are more of an orangey color, although they can range up to yellowish, sometimes down to red. But um, most of our native lady beetles have been outcompeted by this Asian lady beetle. The good news is that the Asian lady beetle fills the same ecological niche as the natives. So they're eating pesty things in your garden. And actually, um, I was reading yesterday about a woman who had all kinds of scale insects on a houseplant and the lady beetles came in her house in the fall and saved her houseplant by eating the scale insects. So you never know what they might do. Wow. What um, a hero. I know. Right. Um, when they, in, in this, a lot of them will die over the winter anyway, that's just nature. Um, and then those that survive will hopefully make their way back outside to start reproducing again and eating those aphids in your garden. Uh, so Jenna, this is a devious question, um, but like if you had a neighbor you didn't like um, and you had a lot, could you put the pheromone, the aggregate pheromone on the outside of their house and have all the lady beetles go to your neighbor's house? If someone is manufacturing the aggregate pheromone, I'm sure you could try that. Go for it. Yeah. I love all Although I, I actually find it really sweet when they come in. I don't know. I think Miles is telling us to move on, not know, to give any on, bad Jenna, ideas. He's like, move okay. on. This is also for you, Jenna, but there, I've seen this too. Um, caterpillars on top of the snow. What's up with that? And who are these caterpillars? What are they doing out in the winter? What's the story, Jenna? So these are some pretty cool insects. So um, with this one, this happened in December. I believe it was mid-December. I got a whole bunch of text messages from people saying, what the heck? I'm finding all these caterpillars on top of the snow. And um, so like I do, I reach out to Sam Jaffe, the caterpillar expert, and he fills me in on the scoop, which he did. So I'll share that with you. So these are um, caterpillars of the large yellow underwing moth, the big moth, large moth, in fact. And these, um, these are the last instar. So what that means is it's the last molt 
as it grows up into um, before it goes into its pupa. And this is its overwintering stage. So this particular phase of this insect has the ability to freeze solid and then on, and then thaw again, and then freeze again, and then thaw again. Now, most insects can't do that. Most insects freeze, and then if they thaw too soon, they're done. But this one is able to go through several freeze-thaw cycles. Um, so apparently, the story is that when it thaws, they're also very cold tolerant. So when it thaws enough, it doesn't even have to be like 50 degrees. It can be quite still pretty cold. They'll come up to the top of the snow and feed on some of the little detritus that we can't even really see that's there. Um, and then as it gets colder, they'll sense that and they'll go back down and they'll freeze again. And then it happens again, they'll thaw again. The downside is if it happens too many times, they're going to use up their natural antifreeze. So they're not going to be able to keep doing it the whole winter long if we have all these cycles of freezing and thawing over and over again. Um, they can do it a few times. So it's also called the winter cutworm. So that's sort of like the more common name of this caterpillar. And interestingly, it looks different at different times of the year. So this particular picture, I think Phil's wife took this picture and I'm not sure when it was, but um, it looks slightly different than the one that someone took for me in the beginning of December. And that's apparently normal with this caterpillar. It changes its coloration depending on how old it is. This would have been early January, Jenna. Okay, so a couple weeks later. Yeah, that's why it looks different. Um, yeah, it's an interesting insect because, and, and strangely, all the things I've read about it, 90% of the things I read said it really doesn't do any kind of damage like a tomato cutworm would in your garden. It's a real generalist feeder. It's not going to go for one particular thing. So don't worry if you see them in the fall, it's not going to, you know, I don't know, kill your chrysanthemums or something. Um, but then if you go on Wikipedia, it says it's a terrible pest. So I'm sort of thinking I'm going with like the UNH Cooperative Extension people and those folks. I don't think it's a pest from what yeah. I've heard. Yeah. So Jenna, I'm just curious then. Um, so this is a caterpillar that could really be threatened by kind of changing climate if we we're having thawing and freezing and yeah, thawing absolutely. and freezing. And I'll just anybody out there in this audience who's looking for a good research project or <laughs> had know somebody who is, this is might be really interesting to see if their population is diminishing because of the kind of strange freeze-thaw cycles we are having in our winters of late. Um, what I'll do too, and I didn't think of it until now, but I'll I'll do it after you guys go on to the next question is I'll put an image in the chat of what the the moth looks like. It's a really striking moth. Um, the the hind wings are just a really neat color. So you may have seen these and not known it in the summertime. Oh, cool. Thanks, Jenna. That was really fascinating. I've been wondering about that too. Aha, look at this. This bird has been in our yard all winter and I have never seen it here during the winter months. Could it be a gray cat bird? And if so, why has it remained here instead of migrating? Thank you, Ray, from January 2023. Phil, what's up with this bird? Well, Ray has it right. This is a gray cat bird. And uh, in the winter, this is a bird that should be on the southern New England coast. So I'm not really sure where Ray is um, is calling in from. Um, do you have any idea if this is interior New England or more coastal regions? Good not question. Sure. Not uh, so sure. so Maybe. anyway, this bird should be on the south coast of New England at the furthest north. So it's it's out of range if it's in the Harris Centers area in southwestern New Hampshire. Um, but it's typically, it's a bird that's here in big numbers in the spring. They usually arrive in New England throughout uh, the months of late April into early May. They make a lot of calls. They're named because they, um, they have this meow type call. Um, so a uh, pretty distinctive sound that they make. They're, they're a distinctive look too. They're a solid color. They're gray, they're medium sized. And this is a, a mimic. So if you know the Northern Mockingbird, which is more familiar in the South. Um, it's actually a state bird in a lot of states. Um, the gray cat bird is its really less celebrated cousin, uh, but I, I think that's, um, it, it should be more celebrated. This is a, a really special bird and a lot of us who have gardens and shrubby areas in our backyards, will see these guys come in and um, their nests are some of the easiest ones to find in the winter too. Uh, they're fairly large, they're low in shrubs, and, uh, and pretty distinctive with the rootlets and grapevines that they use, but they should not be here in the winter. Um, 
so this bird, it could have a few possibilities. Um, it found a good food source, like it looks like it's standing in a, in a pile of um, sunflower uh, hearts there. That's a great food source for the winter. Um, typically though, we'll see these guys overwintering in years of more abundant fruit. And this is not one of those years in the Northeast. So uh, as far as eBird uh, recognizes the records that, bird, that people have put on maps, this is only one of maybe three New Hampshire winter catbirds this year. So a really rare find for the winter. Um, it would be great to, uh, to get a record of it in eBird, which is a database for, uh, for how birds are moving. And it could be a sign that the climates are warming a little bit. This could be a bird that's lingering longer, uh, certain falls. Um, it could be taking advantage of a food source, like I mentioned. Um, it could also have an injury. It's possible that this bird cannot migrate physically, but it was able to find enough food to survive. Um, and lastly, there's always a chance that it has some sort of strange internal compass that is, uh, is a little bit off. Um, so its navigation may have put it on track for the Northeast where it should be in the Southeast in the winter. So lots of possibilities, Wow! but it's good that Ray is feeding it. <laughs> it needs that food right now. Thanks, Phil. That was great. Maybe we'll see if we can track Phil down. I mean, Ray down and find out where he sent it in from. I think we probably have that. So would be interesting. Would you be interested in knowing like if it was? Oh, yeah. OK, we'll let you know then because then it, then you could put it. We'll we'll do a little back researching. Thanks, Phil. That was so cool. All right, let's see what's next. Oh, man, this is my favorite. I found this in the mouse trap today. I don't like killing mice, but I don't feel as though I have an alternative. I think it's a shrew, though I didn't know they ventured into houses. Also, it's very stinky, but not from decomposition. I check the trap every day, and it is less than a day old. It's from Eric, and that's 2022. And this is really right up my alley. This is actually one of my most favorite mammals of New England. This is the um, Northern Short-Tailed Shrew. So Eric did know it was a shrew. They do sometimes venture into people's houses by mistake. They're kind of kind of uh, burrow dwellers. And uh, if your basement is like built into the ground as most basements are, um, and they can get in, sometimes they'll pop out. Um, the reason that it is um, dead it has to do with, this is an animal that has to eat a lot. It has a really high metabolism. Um, it actually eats an equivalent of 195 pounds a day. And if it doesn't eat, even in a few hours of without eating, it will actually die. And it's got such a fast metabolism that its heart beats between 300 and 800 times per minute. Now, all of that is really cool, right? But wait, this shrew is actually one of, it is the only North American venomous mammal. And it is one of the only venomous mammals in the world. There's not that many of them. Some other venomous mammals might include something like a vampire bat that has anticoagulants in its um, saliva, or even something like the platypus that has a, a, a venomous spine or spear that sort of sticks out of their hind limb. Um, but this animal, it has um, no fangs and its venom is actually really closely related to king cobra venom. King, Co I'm going to say it again, king cobra venom. And, and it's actually a star of a movie, a 1959 cult classic called killer shrews. <laughs> um, I've seen it. It's very bad. It's like dogs dressed up like shrews. My dog, which you can hear barking, is like a killer shrew right now. I might have to give her venom. Just joking. Um, but they don't have any fangs to inject their prey. They use their venom to um, capture prey that's larger than themselves often. And this, this, way that they do it is they have 32 teeth and their teeth are really sharp. They're, they're like a lot of insect eaters. So they have a lot of like sharp pointy teeth and they shred up the animal that they're eating and the venom, which comes out from two grooves in their bottom incisors flows into the animal and it paralyzes them. It's a neurotoxin. Um, and actually um, they can either kill their prey outright or this is really gross. They can live 
hoard it, which means that it's basically paralyzed and still alive. So they don't like to eat dead stuff. So if it's something really big, they'll kind of paralyze it and come back and feed on it day after day. And there's been some studies of like a, a paralyzed earthworm from venom from this short-tailed shrew and it lasted up to 15 days. Imagine being paralyzed by venom for 15 days and being slowly eaten because that's what's happening. Um, the stinky odor that Eric describes is they do produce a very bad musk and you often will find them on top of the snow at this time of the year where some hungry fox will sniff them out and be like, oh, I might eat it this. And then when it goes to eat it, it makes this disgusting odor and it will spit it out. And I have found this. I have found fishers uh, spitting back out, foxes spitting it back out. Uh, very interesting. The last kind of cool and amazing thing about the um, venomous shrew is that its venom is being studied for human use. Its venom hasn't really been studied that much, but now they're beginning to isolate what it is. And they're thinking they might be able to use the venom shrew to help people with migraines or um, paralysis, hypertension, or wrinkles. If you're looking for a new wrinkle cream, it might be venomous shrew toxin. So I could go on. I just love this. The last thing I'll just mention is that Phil Brown's own wife, Julie Brown, was actually bitten by a venomous shrew and she has lived to tell the tale. If you get bitten by a venomous shrew, it will not kill you. It might make your fingers swell up, right? Phil, can you, do you, do you remember what happened to Julie? Don't forget to unmute. Mute. Um, I, I don't exactly remember it. It happened before we met, but um, she did have to get medical attention and it was starting to swell up and she was not feeling well. So I think she had to get a, a quick dose of antibiotics. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's true. But it's better to be bitten by a venomous shrew than another venomous animal called the slow loris, which is a primate. And if you and it, it produces venom in its elbow glands, <laughs> which it then licks and mixes with its saliva. And if you get bitten by that, there's no cure. You're basically done for. So um, I guess, you know, if I had my choice, I'd be bitten by a venomous shrew as opposed to the slow loris. I know on that note, let's move on. In this photo, you can see a tiny bit of light at the very top of the opening. We wonder why would a tree split like this? This is from Trisha and it's from this January. And this is, sounds like a question for our tree guy, Jeremy Wilson. Jeremy. I feel a little bashful, like what, how could I make this exciting? It's a tree with a crack in it. No venom, no moving around. Um, I was thinking about well, what 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 are the things when when do I see trees that have cracks in them? And I think they're probably like three or four, well, four maybe four or five different ways. And one of them that's that happens in this season of the year when it gets very very cold is frost cracking, and and that's a you can actually hear it in the woods sometimes where you'll hear a loud bang as 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 the tree. Um, because it's cooling differentially in very cold weather, you'll get times when there a, a crack forms in the in the um, just below the bark, and that crack then will have a, a healing wound around it. Frost cracks typically don't rot in the inside like this. You can see through this hole. The fact that we're looking through the tree means that it's that it's um, that it's rotted inside, and and frost cracks rarely. Uh, do that. So I, th I think it's probably a, some other reason for it. So I was thinking of other reasons. Well, uh, when trees get hit by lightning, they can form a crack in them. Oftentimes that crack uh, follows a, a, a spiral path around the trunk of the tree. Um, this is, this is uh, you know, it looks like a relatively large tree in this particular woods. So maybe this is a, a, uh, tree that was tall enough to get struck by lightning, but it doesn't look like a lightning strike to me in the sense of it doesn't have enough of a spiral to it uh, in, my, in my mind. Um, trees can, can split mechanically. So maybe the tree has a, a branching pattern where it, it, the two branches take off from the trunk in different directions and a heavy snow load one year sort of split the tree apart. That's a possibility. Um, uh, 
the uh, that would that would have had to had to have happened a long time ago in the tree's life um, because of all that considerable rot that exists within it. But I think this is probably something that's easier than than that. This is probably just from a, a wound to the tree where maybe another tree fell down and and scraped along the tree, um, uh, tearing off the bark and 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 killing um, the 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 tree cells below the bark. And so the, the tree basically becomes dead at that point and then has to grow around it. But that wound allows all kinds of infections uh, to make their way into a tree. Um, the bark is a very protective thing, much like our skin. And so that, that sort of makes sense to me here is that at some point this tree, when it was a good bit younger, um, got hit by something, a branch falling or a, or a, uh, a boy scout with a baseball with a with a branch or a, who, who knows what but some something wounded the bark all the way down the trunk of the tree and um, that allowed all sorts of infections to get in and lots of uh, decay to happen and then what we're seeing is the the tree slowly sort of growing back together over that wound um, to the point where it looks like it's almost meeting but it's it's actually just meeting over a hollow center to the tree I don't know. That's that's my best guess. I suppose you could have had a tree in this case where there were two saplings growing together and and uh, uh, had interacted in in some way. But I think it's probably a, a a long long ago wound to the tree, sort of ripping off the bark along one side of it. And this is this is the the scar that we're seeing associated with that. Wow, Jeremy, um, I, I, that was really interesting. And I just want you to know that Phil Brown has placed in the chat a comment that he was a Boy Scout and he would never have hit a tree with a baseball bat. So, I mean, okay, be so careful. it was just me. <laughs> True confessions here. You heard it first. <laughs> That's how Jeremy developed his interest in trees. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's see what our next slide is. Oh, wow. Check this out. A bear came and hit our bird feeder in Greenfield near the Francistown line. Is it no longer safe to feed birds throughout the winter? And wow, uh, Phil, you took this picture, right? This from a couple of years ago? Yeah, that looks like my suet feeder. <laughs> yeah. And when, and, and yes, people, are feeding the birds in the winter. That's what we're told. Put your feeder out in December, take it in in April. Um, but um, we did have some really warm spells. And unlike the woodchuck who sleeps as though it is like practically comatose, it's barely breathes. It breathes like once every four minutes or something like that. Bears um, are not in a deep deep hibernative state. They are in a semi-torpor and snooze and wake, as I explained to my, my third graders when I'm talking about strategies of winter survival. And they will wake and they'll go back to sleep. And if it warms up, uh, bears, particularly only those bears that don't have their cubs, so no, none of the female uh, bears with newborn cubs leave their den during this time. But uh, young male bears in particular, especially if they haven't exactly been satiated eating as much as they can, on those days that are warm, will come out of their hibernative den and kind of wander around, eat, cause some trouble, eat your bird seed. Um, and then as soon as it gets cold again, they'll go back to a den. It might not be the same den that they started in. It might be a different den. And this can happen several times throughout the winter. And this um, fall was a hard fall for bears because we had very, very little um, acorn mast. The acorns were not there. And so a lot of bears were eating people's bird feeders and eating people's chickens and I think there was even a goat on on the road up to the Harris Center that got eaten by a bear this um, fall. The bears were hungry, and um, some of these bears might not have um, gotten enough. And if it warms up, they're going to get up and go for a snack. So I guess oh, temperatures. What temperature ranges are warm? Uh, you know, upper kind of very upper 30s, 40s, 50s. We had some warm days that were in the 40s and 50s not that long ago. And that's really when we were getting these phone calls and people were calling the Harris Center. What I would say is it might be a good idea to take your bird feeders in. If you have a spot that's been hit by a bear in the past, they have really good memories. So, um, you know, 
they're like, oh, I'll go check out Phil Brown's house. He's always got suet feeders out. So if you want to protect your feeders and not um, feed the bears on those days that are warm, just take your feeders in for the moment. And um, Phil, am I right in thinking that on those warm days, it's not as essential to keep feeding the birds, that there's other things that they might be eating, natural seeds that they might be able to find, or is that problematic for birds? Well, I do think that feeders are always going to be a supplemental food source for birds. Um, they're not often going to get dependent on us keeping them alive. Maybe in the case of that cat bird, which is unusual in the winter, it probably is a little more dependent. Um, but in general, yeah, I think um, we're just going to be providing an extra food source. So it's not bad to stop feeding, especially if there's a bear problem. But I would say feed responsibly if you can bring your feeders in, like Susie said. Um, and I think the snow especially lures me into a false sense of security that bears won't be out and about. But like you said, temperature dependent, and maybe when the bears feel like they've run out of um, energy and need another source of food, um, they're out, out on the prowl. Hopefully this weekend they'll, they won't be out. No, no, hopefully not. Yeah. So uh, let's, let's hope, you know, I think this is again, a really interesting example of our changing climate where we're having uh, bears that are coming out more regularly from their, uh, their resting phase. And even, you know, it used to be put your bird feeder out December 1st, take it in April and now they're adjusting. I've heard, you know, don't put your feeders out until end, end of December and bring and bring them in as soon as it begins to warm up. Um, Phil, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? Because I know you might be paying more attention to the bird feeding advice. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's such an enjoyable pastime and so many of us see it as a, a non-negotiable thing to be able to feed the birds. Um, so um, yeah, just, just stressing that responsibility, keeping in touch with your neighbors, finding out about when bears are coming out. It's a good way to, to prevent future bear problems. Definitely. Well said. All right. I think our next thing we have is a turn the tables for all of you. We are going to play an audio and your job is to put in the chat, name the bird that is calling. Well, don't play it yet, Miles, because Phil, um, since it's a bird question, why don't you be the keeper of who gets the correct answer? Whoever gets the correct answer, the Harris Center will be sending you a special gift in the mails. What do you think? Okay. Well, uh, the first answer in was correct. Tony. Uh, Tony's got it. It's a great horned owl. So uh, this is uh, a bird that is uh, is hooting at this time of year because it is breeding season for great horned owls. Even though we're about to see our coldest days of the year, great horned owls are uh, are starting the, the process of finding mates and establishing territories and copulating and, and shortly will be in that egg laying phase. So uh, this is one of our first nesting birds in the Northeast and um, a really fantastic bird that uh, is one of the, the most effective and feared predators in the bird world. They can, uh, they can catch animals as large as skunks, which are fairly heavy and often you know, cats as well. So um, and keep your cats indoors because of great horned owls and addition to other reasons. So um, yeah, great horned owl, cool bird around here. It's not uh, not super common in the Manadnock region. Okay. An article at the Dublin Town Archives from the 1860s interviews someone who'd been catching silver trout his whole life. He said their stomach contents most often contained shrimp. All I'm finding regarding freshwater shrimp in New Hampshire are fairy shrimp. Everything I read says they are exclusive to vernal pools. Question A, were or are there other shrimp in our area? B, during the spring, do vernal pools have runoff? And C, if this fellow was accurate in his observation, what hypothesis could be presented? Thanks, Tim. So I think this is a question that I'm wondering, Karen Seaver, would you like to tackle? I can at least talk about the vernal pools. Well, and... I can talk about the shrimp. 
Yeah, I, and I know a little bit about, so I think you better take, you take the shrimp part, I'll take the vernal pool part. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. Well, first of all, I really like shrimp. And who would ever think that there'd be something like a freshwater shrimp? And Tim's right. There is a type of specialized shrimp that is only found in vernal pools, and those are called fairy shrimp. But there happens to be another shrimp-like creature that lives in ponds and lakes, all around New Hampshire, and that is the scud. And the scud is a side swimming, gray, almost gray, sometimes tannish. It's about the size, I've seen pretty big ones, about a size of a thick eyelash. Um, and they are macroinvertebrate. You can see them and they swim, they feed on kind of the detritus in the water and they would be something that a silver trout would eat. And if you were going to look at the stomach contents, you would be able to see it. I mean, they're not that small, so you can definitely see them. I do encourage all of you, um, in the spring or summer, whenever you get a chance, take yourself a little strainer, kitchen strainer you're not that interested in anymore, bring it down to a pond with a little kind of bucket, scoop up along the mucky edge and you'll probably find yourself some side swimming scuds. They are uh, got 12 little swimmerettes that they kind of wiggle on their side and uh, they swim around in the water. And that's what I know about scuds. I do love them, but I don't think I'd want to eat them. So Karen, what about vernal pools? Yes. So uh, fairy shrimp are awesome critters and you do have to travel to vernal pools in our area to be able to see those. And in fact, uh, the vast, only the vast minority of vernal pools in our area support fairy shrimp because it turns out they need pretty particular water conditions. Actually, it's a type of organism that actually prefers high salinity conditions. So the vernal pool that I'm most familiar with, a vernal pool is a, a, a ephemeral water body that usually forms in the springtime due to spring rains and the melting of snow and meltwater pooling in depressions in the forests and in other habitats. Um, those vernal pools, because they are short-lived and they eventually dry up, some dry up every year, some dry up at a different pattern, but they have to dry up at some point uh, because one of the key characteristics in order to be considered a vernal pool is that it cannot support fish populations. And if it does, it's no longer a vernal pool because the fish will consume a lot of the obligate organisms there. Um, do vernal pools have runoff? Maybe. Um, it's they generally are relatively small in size, and vernal pools kind of are runoff in a way. Some vernal pools are a bit stimulated in terms of where they form by groundwater, uh, but a lot of them form from pooling sort of surface water. So that's kind of what a vernal pool is, is this collection of forest runoff that forms one of the most incredible biodiverse ecosystems that we have in our forest that's filled with all these amazing small life forms. So they're certainly more than just a puddle in the woods. Yay, well said, Karen. All right, that's cool. Let's go see what our next question is. Wow, whoa, what is this thing? Uh, for a number, number of years, we've been puzzled by how this tree or trees manage two distinct species on one trunk. It's located in a local cemetery where we often walk. I took this photo in early spring, but the evergreen looks basically the same year round. Jeremy, are these uh, Siamese twins? Uh, what are, what is, what's going on here with this interesting growth? Um. I think I think uh, before I answer that, I think we should we should do a little more research on the silver trout that was mentioned in the last thing. I'm not a fisher person, so I, I didn't I didn't key into that originally. But but I think the silver trout that is being referred to in that was um, in two water bodies in New Hampshire and is it, and is extinct now. And Dublin Lake was one of those water bodies. Very cool, Jeremy. Thank you. So. That's not a tree. 
But these these trees, I'm, I'm going to guess because it's not a good enough picture to sort of identify species here. It's not a good a good enough picture to see the actual trunk or trunks, which I'm more inclined to believe that this is. My guess is that it's some kind of juniper down below and obviously a spruce emerging from that. Um, and my guess is it's two separate trees. And and, and the, the spruce is a, is a real tree. And so it, as it got above the juniper, it's sort of taking off at this point and, and starting to shade out the, the juniper shrub that's underneath it. Um, how could it be one tree? Well, there, there is this amazing thing that you can do with trees called grafting, which is, is uh, attaching uh, uh, an individual branchlet onto the, the trunk or, or a branch of, uh, of an existing tree. And within species, you can, you can um, if it's the same species, you can almost always do it, almost across, uh, across many different types of trees graft one one uh, branch onto the tree uh, across uh, across species is if they're in the same genus and relatively closely related so if we had a spruce on the bottom and then there was a spruce grafted on the top I might believe that this was one tree but because it's it's two different genuses it, it doesn't make a lot of sense that this could be a graft where where uh, a branch or from from the spruce was was grafted onto the juniper below. So my guess is that it's just complicated in there and it's hard to see the the fact that there's there's two stems, probably more than two stems because the shrub probably has multiple stems and then there's a there's one spruce stem within it. Having said that, grafting is just extraordinary. I mean, it's what allows us to have many of our fruit crops because of of fungal issues with different kinds of rootstock and having to grow uh, apples on specific specific kinds of rootstocks. So there, there's there's grafting of trees all over the place in terms of horticulture. And I've actually seen, uh, I've been in a plantation where there were, I, I was like five or six different kinds of pines grafted onto white pine rootstocks. It was just the most bizarre thing because the all of a sudden the trunk changes from a white pine to a red pine, for example. And, and uh, you'll see the wound where the graft happened but the, the red pine is growing with the white pine rootstock. Pretty extraordinary. So cool. But again, in this case, because it's because it's two different genuses, I'm, I'm guessing this is two separate trees, two separate uh, uh, shrub and a tree. So Jeremy, maybe Sue needs to crawl under there and investigate a little further. <laughs> she really <laughs> needs to dig into that prickly foliage. And, yeah, and sounds, like, sounds like a job for a Boy Scout. <laughs> Okay. All right. Let's see what's next. Oh, we've got a poll here for you. Okay. In just a moment, we're going to launch a poll. Your chance to vote. The icon, I can never say his name. Karen, can you say it? Punxsutawney? Of course. I'm from Pennsylvania. Why I asked. Phil. And I, I, yeah, shout out. I know there's a couple other Pennsylvanians here tonight. Go Yay. Phil. Yay. Okay. All right. So the icon, he has competition now. Which new groundhog is giving Phil a run for his money by making its prediction several days ahead of the Pennsylvanian woodchuck? Okay. Here are the choices. Montpelier Monty, Buffalo Bert, Westport William, Chesterfield Charlie, and our Staten Island Chuck. Do you want to give us the results and reveal the answer, Miles? Sure. Well, the answer is kind of tricky because there's more than one. <laughs> um, so our top votes here were Chesterfield Charlie, which was fabricated, and Staten Island Chuck, which is real. But <laughs> the one that we saw the article about was Buffalo Bert. What? Wait a minute. There's really a Staten Island Chuck? All right, yeah. Phil, you're from Staten Island. What's <laughs> up with this? Yeah, Staten Island Chuck has a, a pretty high accuracy rating of predicting the end of winter, uh, 80% compared to uh, Punxsutawney Phil's 39%. Wait a minute, so. but okay, how long has Staten Island hmm. Chuck been predicting weather for? Ooh, a long time. I remember seeing Staten Island Chuck when I was a kid, although I think he has successors, so it's probably multiple Chucks. How long yeah. do they live? Uh, not that well not in that the long. zoo, they live a while, but Punxsutawney Phil, um, the one that 
I think this is a new one. He just recently passed away and they replaced him with a new one. But I don't think it's a very nice thing to wake up a sleeping groundhog. I mean, they don't want to wake up. I've heard that they're very feisty when you wake them up. They're crabby. They try to bite you. And uh, yeah, so you're saying Staten Island Chuck has an 80% accuracy rate? This is what I've read. He's going to replace Al Roker. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Wow, that was great. All right. Here's a question that I also have wondered about. Why do some parts of the ground never seem to retain snow, even with the large amounts of snow that have fallen? This is from my old rail bed near my house, and these circular areas tend to lack snow cover in all but the coldest and snowiest conditions. Can someone explain why? And I think this is from Phil and Karen. I don't know. You seem like you might know the answer to this. Yeah, I think I do. I have a suspicion anyway. So. Um, this is something that I notice a lot too. And sometimes it's in this nice sort of string of pearls kind of pattern. Uh, other times you can have it where it's just one of these snow-free or ice-free areas. And if you think about it, um, you can think about like, what's, what could be different here? And here we have, you know, soil with leaf litter on top. We also have something else in the mix that has a, 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 some chemical attributes about it that makes it have a high, what we call specific heat, meaning that it takes a lot of energy in order to warm up this particular uh, type of environment. And um, maybe someone else has come to the I suspicion that it's likely due to water. And I have a feeling that this is what we call a, a forest seep, where Groundwater is um, coming close to the forest floor surface and causing there to be a lot of water in the soil. And for that water to freeze would take tons of energy. It would have to get frigid cold. So even over these next few days where it's going to be really, really, really cold, even in some of those really depths of winter conditions, seeps still won't freeze because they're actually underlain by relatively stable soil temperatures and also this wealth of groundwater below that is, uh, you know, kind of far more consistent in its temperatures than what we have sort of at and below, uh, at and above the forest surface. So it's really because of water dynamics. And this is some of the highest quality water we have on our planet. And these are really important sources of liquid fresh water for wildlife, even in the winter time. So you can see a lot of uh, animals sort of traveling in order to take advantage of these seeps. Um, of course they can eat snow too, but it's interesting to, to sort of see how they've become these sort of, you know, refugia for a lot of different wildlife throughout the winter. Wow, that was so fascinating, Karen. Thank you so much. I've wondered that and I've thought that it had to do with water, but I loved all that explanation. And I wouldn't be surprised, folks out there, if the word forest seeps appears in some turn the tables in a future Ask a Naturalist. So nice job answering that. Okay, how are the current snow conditions affecting owl populations? I haven't seen our resident owl this year from Anonymous. Phil, you're on the hot seat today. Day. there's lots of questions for you this is right up your alley yeah this has been a great winter to see barred owls um, I bet a lot of you have seen them in your backyards or just driving around um, they're often pushed to roadsides in winter like this and especially when the snow conditions are a certain way uh, right now the snow in most of the northeast is uh, is very firm due to ice events in the past um, so this forces the rodents to um, to find different ways to get places. They're not they're not tunneling as easily through the subnivian layer. Perhaps they're not uh, running underneath the snow uh, as easily as they would uh, with powdery snow. So they're being pushed to the edges, often roadsides, and this is why we see a lot of barred owls hit by cars in the winter. Many of them are are taken into rehabilitators alive, but many more end up dying. So um, you'll also see these owls in your backyard bird feeders like this photo shows. And uh, that's because they're looking for an easy source of food. And this is coupled with 
the um, the lack of uh, lack of rodents this winter in a lot of the Northeast because the oak crop, the acorns, were just really not there this year. It wasn't a big mast year, and the past couple of years have been good mast years. So populations of rodents were very high because they fed well. Uh, so lots of owls survived in the last couple of years. There's a real plethora of young barred owls out there and they're being forced to the edges and looking for food wherever they can get it. So uh, watch out rodents underneath the bird feeders at night. Wow, another, an, another kind of example of perhaps climate change really impacting our own local uh, flora and fauna. So, wow, that's really interesting. Thanks, Phil. And I think that might have been our last question, Miles, true? Yeah, we're gonna end with this owl. And thank you so much everybody for joining us.